Welcome back. Let's briefly recall what we did last time in the first lecture. So, um, recall. Last time we we introduced or uh, recalled the definition, the notion of the graph, this graph notion, and we saw some basic families like path, cycles, and complete complete graphs or complete multipartite graphs. Um, we've also seen this. Um, lemma saying that the sum of degrees in the graph equals to two times the number of edges. Actually, this lemma has a name called handshaking lemma. A useful one. Um, okay. And then we saw some uh, examples, some cute examples of uh, some Combinatorial results about graphs. Uh, one is the uh, um, Mantel theorem. Mantel theorem is saying that if you have an n vertex graph, you don't have three vertex complete graph as a subgraph. We explain what what is subgraph containment. So you don't have a triangle as a subgraph, then the uh, Mantel maximize the number of graphs to satisfy this condition, saying that the number of edges, the max you can have is n squared over four. With maximum achieved uniquely by this complete bipartite graph that's balanced with roughly half of the vertices on each side. An argument we've seen is one of Perhaps the most common and useful combinatorial arguments is using induction on the number of vertices n. Okay, so so we've seen induction last time. We've also seen um, arguments using probabilistic methods. This Ramsey number lower bound construction. Using probability, so if you see me for the first time, it is really amazing that we don't have to construct something explicit to exhibit the lower bound for Ramsey. We can just say with positive probability there exists an outcome of a random coloring satisfying all the properties we're looking for. Okay, we've also seen another surprising connection. Um, we're proving something purely combinatorial, purely basic, is an uh, odd-town, even-town problem using uh, tools from linear algebra, sometimes dimension of, uh, of this vector space at 2 to the n. Well, linear algebra. So as you can see from this first, uh, first class that extreme combinatorial says studies a variety of different discrete objects and um, using a variety of tools from other fields. And this is, we're borrowing tools from other fields, but in recent years, a lot of other fields, the open problems, they are solved while some methods and results from combinatorics, external combinatorics. Um, so today, as, as second half, we will continue the introduction and introduce a little bit more uh, discrete objects, and then we're going to move on to the officially the first part of extreme um, graph theory on Turan type problem. So let's see. Uh, let's continue last time about this Ramsey lower bound. Another very famous uh, Ramsey type result is this Erdős Sekeres problem. So today. So what is Erdős Sekeres problem? Again, we are studying a discrete uh, structure, which is a sequence of numbers, a sequence of, let's consider a sequence of uh, natural numbers, say.
Um, let's do an example. Let's say uh, 10, 5, 7, 4, 6. Okay, a sequence of numbers. You can write as many as you want. Stop somewhere. We have a finite sequence. Now, what we cared about is in this sequence, how long can you find the monotone subsequence? We want to find long monotone subsequence. What does it mean? It means either it's increasing or decreasing. Okay, monotone increasing, decreasing. Let's see an example. Uh, this just using this example. If we care about the the increasing one, the blue one, what's the longest increasing one? We cannot do better than two, right? You can choose either five, seven, or four, six. There's no increasing sequence of length three here. Very obvious. Let's look at the the monotone decreasing one. The decreasing one we can do slightly better. We can choose 10. Then we drop down to either five and four or 10, seven, six. Right? You go from left to right. You want to choose monotone sequence. And the early Sacrus problem give us a bound on the length of the monotone subsequence that we can always guarantee in the sequence of given length. Okay, here's the statement theorem. Hurtish, Sakaris. Um, it says that for any for any sequence. Any sequence. So the enemy is giving us sequence of distinct. So you put on different numbers. Otherwise, you put all the same number. There's no monotone strictly, strictly monotone sequence. Distinct natural numbers. Okay. Of size. Um, k minus one square plus one looks a little bit strange. Let's finish the statement. Then we can always guarantee a monotone sequence of size k. So this example right here is when k equals to uh, 3, right? 3 minus 1 squared is 4 plus 1 is 5. So we chose, I happened to cho choose a uh, length five sequence. We found a monotone sequence, in particular, the, the monotone decreasing sequence of length three. So that's guaranteed. So basically, early Sakharis is saying what happened up there uh, is not magic. And we can guarantee longer and longer as long as you start with longer and longer sequence. Let's give a proof of this. So the reason I mentioned this example is because it's Ramsey flavor, the important part of extreme combinatorics. And also um, it introduced this, another discrete structure, sequence of natural number, purely discrete, discrete. And the argument is a pigeonhole, averaging pigeonhole argument. Yet another, apart from in induction, another very useful basic tools that we can use uh, in combinatorics. Let's see this proof. Idea is just pigeonhole. Pigeonhole or averaging argument. Okay, so how do we prove that? It's a very nice, smart idea of using pigeonhole. Um, okay, so here's the proof. We have, um, these numbers, let's call these numbers, take a, consider a sequence, an arbitrary sequence, a1, a2, dot, 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 a k minus one square plus one, where each one of these is a natural number, right? So this is arbitrary, arbitrary and our goal is to find so always be clear what we need to do, okay? Our goal is to find the monotone 
either increasing or decreasing sequence. Let's call AI1, da, 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 AIK in there. That's how it goes. So what are we going to do? We're going to do some labeling on these numbers. So a label, let's say, label each number AI um, by the length of longest, this is the key part, okay? Key idea. Label each number AI by the length of the longest monotone increasing sequence ending at AI. Okay. Once again, let's see this example. Seven, five, ten, five, seven, four, six. So ten, five, seven, four, six. Let's give it a label. Okay, let's call um and let's call this label L of AI. That's the label. So here is the AI. Here is L of AI. What's what will be the label? Well, if you look at 10, what's the longest length, longest sequence, monotone sequence ending at 10? It's the first number, it's just one. Okay. Let's move on to the second number. What's the longest increasing sequence ending at five? Again, one, because 10 is bigger than five. We'll move on to seven. What is the longest increasing sequence ending at seven? Now we have two because you can do five, seven, okay? So this is two and for four, four is the smallest one. So you cannot add anything before. It's again one and six. Six, the only thing smaller than six is either four or five, but they are in the wrong order. So you can only choose one. Again, you only have an increasing sequence of less two. So let's write two. Is that clear, the process? Good, so far so good. Now we make some observation and the result follows. What will be the observation? Well, um, first observation is that, um, observation one, each label is strictly less than K. Because if you ever see a label of size K or above, that means you already have a monotone increasing sequence ending at this number AI. We are done. Otherwise, we are happy, okay? Observation two. Observation two is that, um, is this pigeonhole. What's the uh, uh, pigeonhole? So each label is a number between one and k minus one. And the total numbers we have is k minus one squared plus one. Then by pigeonhole, one of the label between one to k minus one is assigned to at least k numbers. By pigeonhole, and observation one, there exists some label, let's say R, in the first K minus one integer that is associated to at least K number. This is a number such that there exists some K number A, AIK such that their label is R for every J in K. That's what I just said. Okay, now let's make the last observation and the proof finish. The last observation is, let's look at this number. AI1, AI2, dot, 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 AIK. These are the numbers. Now, the last observation is they all have the same label, right? Their label
They are all R, R, R. What does it mean R? Let's look at, for example. Uh, so how do we finish the proof? The last observation is that this sequence, they form the monotone decreasing sequence, AIJ. Why is that true? Okay, so all I need to prove is that this number, they're going in this way, it's decreasing. Suppose otherwise, if AI1 is, let's say, just prove the first one, is less than AI2, then what we know, we know that there is some monotone, um, there is some monotone increasing sequence go all the way ending at AI1 of lens R. Then we can go one more step extending to AI2 if AI2 is bigger than AI1, right? That means the longest monotone increasing sequence ending at AI2 would have been at least R plus one contradicting to the labeling that we assign it to, okay? So AI1 bigger than AI2, or otherwise, the label of AI2 would have been at least R plus one using um, da, 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 by pending AI2 to a longest sequence to end the AI1. I will skip writing the remaining. Any questions? Okay. Very good. Um, I would, this remark is that, again, last time I mentioned, whenever you see such results, we should always ask ourselves, good, we can guarantee a monotone sequence of size K, but is this bound the best we can do? Can we have fewer numbers, a shorter sequence that can still guarantee K? And the answer is no, we cannot guarantee a better if you have shorter one. In other words, this is optimal bound, okay? Remark, the bound is optimal. Okay. So um, here's a tight example. So I want to add, visualize this tight example geometrically. Let's think of it like this. We have x axis and y axis, right? The x axis will be the index. This a1, a2, dot, 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 to a n. The x axis is the index of the, these n numbers. The y axis is the actual value of a i. So actually, I should just write this is the index. So this is the first number, second number, third number, nth number, right? Y axis is as the value of A. So you have A1, A2, A3, dot, 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 to AN. So how, what does it mean tight example? That means we have to find a sequence of size k minus one square without monotone increasing or decreasing sequence of size k, right? That's what we have to do. If you have one more, we can guarantee. If you have one less, this example shows no. And the example is easy. You just do this. Oops. How do I try? So here, let's take k equal to five example. So what I would do is. Okay, what does this mean? That means 
the first in the number of numbers you have k minus one numbers here and the number of blocks this is a block and the number of blocks is also k minus one okay so inside each block this is a block k minus one number k minus one number k minus one number in total k minus one square numbers and their ordering is in the first block the ai's they are decreasing in the second block, all the numbers are bigger than all the numbers in the first block, but they are decreasing, so on and so forth. Now, what is the longest monotone decreasing sequence? If you take a decreasing sequence, it has to, the first number has to start somewhere, let's say here, right? Then the only way to go smaller, you have to go to the right. You have to take a sequence from here, right? You can only go down like this, which is size k minus one. You cannot jump there. What's the longest increasing sequence? If you start somewhere, let's say here, you have to start somewhere, increasing, and you have to go to the right, you can only take one number from each block. So again, k minus one. Okay. Another remark is that it's easy also to prove an asymmetric version. Asymmetric version means for any sequence, where the size is a minus one, b minus one plus one, then either you have an increasing sequence, size a, or decreasing sequence, size b. If, it's, if this is not clear, try to prove it, mimicking what we just did above. Now, um, good. So let's introduce one another discrete object. Last time I should have mentioned it together with um, the graphs. So for, our, for graphs, we have directed graphs also. So for graphs, remember, we only have a binary symmetry relation between vertices. But now we can, uh, for directed graph, we can assign directions to the edges. Sometimes even one edge can get two directions, okay? The special type I want to talk about is tournament. So what is the tournament definition? Definition of tournament is, is a directed graph or maybe let's say this way, it's an orientation. It's, you can identify with an orientation, ori, orientation of complete graph. Okay, by orientation, I mean every edge just get one direction. So here's example, you can go like this. Each edge gets one exactly one direction. This is a tournament. Okay. One way to think about this, you can use this to model some game, some sports game, right? If if you have n teams, you have this complete graph one to n, n teams. If you play a game between every two football team or basketball team, you can use this arrow to indicate if you have an arrow from n to one, that means the team n beats team one. Right. You can record all this information. That's why it's called tournament. So I'll leave it as exercise for you to show that um, here's a proposition, which I'll leave as exercise. For every tournament, of order n, there exists a Hamiltonian path. Hamiltonian path, that just means a path, a directed, a directed 
Hamiltonian path. That just means a path uh, that visits all the vertices. So in this example, let's see, where's the Hamiltonian path? In this whole vertex example, uh, here, 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 right? You have this uh, directed path. You have to respect the direction. You should go the same direction and you can visit all the vertices. Now this proposition is saying that this is not coincidence. For any large n, for any orientation on this complete graph, you can always find this. And the proof is not so hard. Remember in the first lecture, how do we embed a long cycle? We take the longest path, right? So try to use this argument. Take the longest directed path and try to analyze how vertices outside. If there's no vertex, vertex outside, we are done. And try to analyze how vertex outside sends edges to this longest path. So um, the next discrete object is um, uh, instead of a pole set. So let's start with a very special uh, pole set. Um, maybe, maybe let me not mention the, so this is, uh, I want to talk about Spern, Sperner's theorem. So um, let's consider uh, right. Let's consider um, this the set of all subsets, the power sets. This is the power set of the first n integer. Okay. There are two ways to, to visualize this. Um, let me first, let's say the first way. You can also visualize it as uh, the, the set of all binary sequence of length n. So let's first draw this. This is also called hypercube. Okay, let's consider example where n equal to three. Three dimensional hypercube, how do we draw it? It looks something like this. Okay, it looks something like this. Now, um, Actually, let me give a second. Okay. So and um, let's imagine this is zero, 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 right? That's the origin. And if you move to the right, let's say this is the first direction. That's one, zero, zero. And if you go up, second direction, zero, one, zero. And if you move to the right, this vertex will be, you move in two directions. So it's one, one, zero. And this guy here, third direction would be zero, zero, one. And here is first and third, one, zero, one. Here is, this is you move on all direction. So it's one, one, one. And the last one here is you go in third direction and second direction. So zero, one, one, okay? 
This is the hypercube. So as you can see, hypercube is a graph where this is the graph. The vertex set is all 0, 1 to the n. And what's the edge set? Two binary strings, they are adjacent, if and only if they differ at exactly one place. OK? If and only if they differ at one exactly one place, one coordinate. Now, this has a natural correspondence to this two to the, two to the n power of subset containment lattice. So this is a family of all subsets of n. How do we draw it? Oh, I want to draw example when n equals to three. So at the top, let's draw from below maybe. Here's the empty set. You don't contain anything. That's a subset of one to three. Or you contain exactly one element. That's the singleton. So if you contain one, two, or three, right? Or you contain two elements. Um, let's say, how do I try? One, two. One, three, two, three, okay? And we put an edge when a subset is a subset of another subset. So here, empty set is a subset of singleton, so I put an edge. And one is a subset of one, two, we put an edge. One is also a subset of one, three, you put an edge. Two is a subset of one, two. Two is a subset of two, three. Three is a subset of one, three. Three is a subset of two, three. Okay, and at the end, one, two, three is a subset of is a subset of everything. And notice that I only draw edges between two consecutive layers. I don't draw it down there. Down there, of course, we also have this edge, but it's sort of transitivity. If I have this going up, then also this guy is a subset of that. But let's not introduce this transitivity for now. This is just the containment letters of a uh, family of subs all subset of n where we draw the containment only for consecutive le levels. Now, as you can see, this is precisely um, the hypercube. Just we tilt it a little bit. You will have a different way of seeing it. And there's a natural correspondence, right? Let's draw the correspondence. If you look at the empty set, it corresponds to 0, 0, 0. Because if you, you, you can associate it with this characteristic vector, Okay, zero, zero, zero means you don't contain the first element, you don't contain the second element, you don't contain the third, third elements. If you look at one, two, this, this, this guy one, two, that means you contain the first and second that correspond to this guy, right? You contain the first and second, so on and so forth. So who are we gonna prove? What's this uh, Sperner's lemma is about? It's about finding in this structure, they want to find a large family satisfying that no set is contained in another. So let's define this definition. Um, definition. A family of sets, let's say, uh, uh, how do I call it? A family of sets, let's say A, which is a subset of two to the n, is an empty chain if, um, no element of A is a subset of another, okay? So let's try to come up with some natural family of anti-chain. 
will be a natural family. If you want, what, what's a necessary condition for, what's a necessary condition for subset containment? One set is contained in another if they are two different sets. The size of one must be larger than the other. In other words, if we take two different sets of same size, then definitely no one is containing another. That means if I take all the sets from the same level, it's an empty chain. For example, all the singletons or all the sets of size two. Okay, natural example. Any level, i.e. all sets of the same size, Um, it's an anti chain. It's an anti chain. Da, 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 da. Right? That's a natural one. There are some others. There are some non trivial ones. For example, let's do again here a non trivial that does not come from level. You can do um, purple. You can do one and two, three. One and two, three, not they are anti chain. Different size. This is an untreated one. But Sperner theory is saying the largest anti chain we can always guarantee always come from a level. Okay, a level of sets of all same size. And which level has the largest size? It's basically binomial coefficient, n choose k. And when k is at the middle, n over 2, that's the largest. Okay, so let me write it down. And the case level, let's say n choose k is the number of all size k sets. And we have, this is always at most n over n choose 2 floor sim. This is trivial. You can try to prove it. Um, so we have a natural lower bound on the largest anti chain. You just take the middle level. So large you can find is at least as large as this. And Sperner theorem is saying you cannot do better theorem. The size of the largest anti chain in this um, in N is uh, in two to the N is N over N choose two floor C. Okay. Actually, from the proof, you can derive something slightly stronger. You even know that it has to come from a level. Uh, the middle layer. But let's just prove this quantitative one. Um, to prove this, we're going to actually prove some things. Um, we're going to prove it through a very famous inequality. This is so called LYM inequality. LYM stands for Lupel. Yamamoto and uh, Michelle King. What's this um, inequality? It says that for any anti chain F, which is a subset of two to the n, okay, anti chain means once again no elements is contained as a subset of another, then if you sum up this quantity, you look at all sets in your family in this anti chain, you sum up one over and choose the size of F. This is at most one. Okay. So, um, Let's first quickly see 
how uh, how ym implies Werner. It's very quick computation. Let's do it here. If we have lym, well, sum of all n over f, right? But n over f, let's say f has size k, n choose k is at most this guy, right? So that means this is lym. One is bigger than this guy. But this is bigger than sum over one over n choose the middle layer, right? Simple inequality. And the, now each sum is the same number. You sum over it f times. This number, okay? I don't even need this. Very good. So let's try to prove this LYM inequality. Um, we're gonna prove it in two different ways, although essentially they are the same way, okay? I want to illustrate that this is yet um, another useful combinatorial argument. So we've seen induction Right, what, how, what, what we have seen, seen? We have seen induction in Mantel. And we've seen this pigeonhole, Erdős Sekeres. Okay, today we're going to see yet a third one, equally useful uh, double counting, very simple argument. Double counting here. For LYM. What's double counting? As, as the name suggests, we, we look at one quantity and we're going to count it in two different ways. And what I want to illustrate here is that so let's first do double counting arguments. Um, proof one. We're gonna double count, double counting. We're gonna count the, uh, the set of all permutations of N. This number, we're gonna double count this number. Obviously the number of Number of all permutations, very simple. One way of counting it, we can directly write the equality. There are n factorial ways to arrange n elements. Very easy. And let's come up with a different way, a non-trivial way to count it. Second way, for each element, let's look at, let's say element, let's order elements uh, in F, let's say this is, uh, yeah, okay. For elements in F, let's pick an arbitrary one. We consider the number of permutations satisfying, how does it look like? Satisfying, um, you start with F followed by complement of F. Okay, but F can be arbitrarily arranged here. This is a permutation, right? So you get all the permutations such that the element of F comes first, appears first, before all the other elements in F, uh, not in F. Is that clear? And the number of such elements is precisely, you first give a permutation on F, that's F, size of F factorial, we put it on top, beginning, and the rest you commute it arbitrarily. And you have M minus size of F factorial. Very simple, okay. So far, nothing magic. Now here comes the important one. We haven't used the hypothesis yet. What's the hypothesis? F is an empty chain. So no set is contained in another. 
let's call this set of permutations, let's call it P, okay, of F, P of F. The obs key observation is that P of F and P of F prime, there's no permutation that get assigned to two different sets in F. Okay, let's prove this. How does permutations in this look like? You have some elements in F comes first in arbitrary order, and you have no F elements comes later, right? How does this look like? You have elements of um, F prime comes like this, and you have rest of the elements, M minus F prime, right? If there is a permutation that, that's of this shape and also of this shape, what does it mean? That means if I crop it here, they look the same at the beginning, right? And what it means is that F is a subset of F prime, okay? So otherwise, F is a subset of F prime or vice versa. O F prime is a subset of F, okay? That's a contradiction. In this picture, F is a subset of F prime. Is that clear? And we are done with the double counting. So for each set, for each element in F, we assigned, we associate F, the size of F factorial times N minus size of F factorial. We sum, and all these permutations assigned to different sets are disjoint set of permutations. So the total number, you sum them up, is at most the total number of permutations. Nothing is overcounted. Nothing is counted twice, right? So we get sum over. So size of PF, F in F, um, is what? It's precisely the sum of F in F, X factorial, M minus X factorial, which is less than N factorial, the total number of permutations. Uh, now if you just arrange this, that's the LYM inequality. Okay, you can rearrange this. Any questions? So this is the first proof, very easy, double counting. And the point I wanna illustrate is that sometimes it's good to think of things uh, probabilistically. So meaning that, uh, and, and here double counting, sometimes double counting can be phrased in a probabilistic way. So you can use a uniform sampling. So let's rewrite this. Basically it's the same proof, but in a probabilistic way, okay? So how can we do counting in the probabilistic way? Here we consider the set of all permutations. So the quantity of, this, of all permutations is the same as if you randomly sample, uniformly sample, okay. So what I want to say is the following. If you have a set of 10 objects, right? If people don't tell you there are 10 objects, 10 books in this drawer, instead they tell you, if I pick a book, pick every book with the same probability, and the probability that I pick a particular book is 10%, then we also know there are 10 books. This is what I want to say. If you use the double counting where you use this, some set and its cardinality, here is the set of all permutations, and you can rephrase it as you do uniformly sampling over this. So let's try to put this into uh, write down the detail, the proof two. A 
Again, we try to prove Ly and inequality. Let's recall what we want to prove. For any anti chain, we want to prove this. The sum over all elements in this anti chain, one over n choose the size of these elements is at most one. So, um, If you haven't seen this proof, it looks uh, a little bit magic, but now we know we should consider some permutation. So the first line is perhaps not that magic anymore. We're gonna take a random permutation uniformly. Take a uniform random permutation, let's call it sigma, and let's call the image of each coordinate sigma one, sigma two to sigma n. Okay, in this symmetric group Sn, in the future, if I don't specify when I write this tilde, that means I sample some element from this set uniformly at random, the uniform random elements. Okay, so this is our permutation. Now, uh, let's consider uh, for every k in n, let's consider the initial the initial segment of this image of the permutation, okay? Let ik be sigma one, sigma two, sigma k, the first k elements in this permutation. First k elements in this permutation, okay? Now, um, the key observation is that, well, this is a simple observation. I want, this is the nested sequence. Obviously, we just take more and more number in, in the initial sections. If it's a nested sequence, immediately, what do we know? And most one of these sets in this nested sequence can appear as an element in our anti-chain. Right, so that means at most one of them can be in F because F is an empty chain. Good. Now, um, and this is the quantity we're gonna do double counting. The number of I K that appears in F, we're gonna double count this thing. It's again double counting, but in a probabilistic way. We know in this way that the number of IK appears in F is at most one. But let's do it probabilistically. Um, on the other hand, S, let's note that, note, what do we have to notice? IK is a size K set, right? And since we choose sigma uniformly at random, among all permutations. What it means is that the first k elements of sigma could be any k set with same probability. Any k set appears as the initial segment with same probability in sigma. So i k is uniformly distributed. This notation means all k subsets of n, okay? So ik is uniformly distributed over all k sets. What does that mean? That means we can compute the expecting number of iks in f, okay? Equals to, expecting number is how many iks? There are n of them. K from one to n. And for each i k, the probability is what? The probability is f k over n choose k, where this f k is the number of k sets in f. Right, why? For each k set in F, 
it has probability one over n to k to be this initial segment. Everything has the same probability. And use linearity of expectation, every one of these fk, k sets in f, they have the same probability. So you group them up like this. Does it make sense? Some of you looks a little bit confused. So let me write it maybe slightly slowly. Let me write a little bit more step. This guy is what? Expectation of number of ik in f is the sum of k equal to one to n, the probability that ik is in f, right? That's the definition of expectation. Now, what's the probability of ik in f? That equals to, um, yeah, so let's look at what's this guy. That equals to the probability that i k equal to f for some f in f, right? I don't know if I should write this. So equal to some setting there. And this probability is one over n to k because every k set has the same probability. This is disjoint event for different f. So you should sum them up. How many such events? The number of k sets in f, okay? Now, so this precisely equals to um, sum of <coughs> f in f, or maybe I should just write this. Maybe I shouldn't write this one. This is more clear, right? The expected number of ik in f, for every element in f, it appears to be some IK with this probability and use linearity of expectation. These two are the same. Okay, now what do we know? We know that this expectation, we know from before that the number of IK in F is at most one, let alone expectation or not. So if this quantity is at most one, if you define some random element, it's a random variable, the expectation is again at most one, right? This is at most one. Now, this guy is at most one as, as we want. Any questions? All right. If there's no question, so this, let's remember this uh, lattice shape. This will be. This is actually a very special type of post set structure that we will study later in the course. Roughly speaking, it just says that you have some set of elements. In this case, it's all subset of n, like this. And you have some pair that are comparable, like one and one, two are comparable because one is a subset of one, two. But you also have some element that are not comparable, like this, the elements in empty chain. Not comparable because one, neither one is a subset of another. Here, comparable is subra contained. But it could be any binary relation um, to indicate uh, you can have more abstract, more, more variety. Okay. Um, so that would be uh, the, the introduction of different discrete objects and, and different combinatorial arguments. We've seen induction, we've seen pigeonhole averaging, we've seen double counting, and we can freeze double counting in the probabilistic way, and we can prove constructions using probability uh, and, and, and dimension, dimension arguments on linear algebra, right? So let's start with the first uh, topic, the topic one is the extremal theory. 
Actually, you, you already know what is extremal graph theory because Mantel theorem is one of the first results in this direction. So now let's officially introduce how problems look like in extremal graph theory. So this um, we call two-run type problem, two-run problem. What's the setup? The setup is we um, we give the question is if a graph is h free means that you don't contain a small graph h as uh, you consider all graph g right you have m vertices and h free the question is what's the maximum number of edges in g this is abuse of notation G is a fixed graph. What I mean is consider the family of all M vertex graph uh, that's H3. And among all these graphs, you maximize the number of edges. You can have a notation. Nowadays, this is called Tura number, or sometimes called extremal number of H, a graph H. So this it equals to the maximum of EG where G has is the M vertex graph and H3. Let's use this. Uh, this function to record this quantity. And the Mantel theorem in this language, in this terminology, is saying that the extremal number of NH equals to N squared over four, the flow of this, okay? So in the next couple of weeks, we're gonna study this extremal number for various different type of graphs, uh, right? Let's first, let's see the, the, the first results, which explains why this type of problem is not called uh, Mantel's problem, but uh, Turan problem, uh, because Turan is the person who uh, sort of uh, ex find the first non-trivial extension and popularize the problem. So, ah, no one, Tell me, I made a mistake here. This is triangle, right? K3, if you, K3 free, triangle free, sense go. So, um, so before explaining Turan's results, um, let me, introduce a special graph. So this is called Turan's graph, Turan graph, T N R, two indices. What's this definition? Well, I'll write down definition in a bit, but let's draw the picture, it's easier. It's basically a complete multi-parte graph that's balanced, completely balanced. So you have, um, you cut, vertices into same number of vertices, but sometimes R is not divisible. N is not divisible by R, so you have to pull <coughs> flow of ceiling signs, da, da, da. And you leave everything empty inside and you put all the edges in between. So you put all these cross edges. This is Turan graph, okay? So let's write it. It just, uh, N vertex um, complete multi parti graph with each parti set of size N over R floor, uh, floor or N over R ceiling.
Okay, that's the definition. Now we can say Turan's theorem. Um, Turan's theorem is saying that the extremal number we've seen many of theorem is for getting three vertex complete graph. Now Turan can do any click of any click size, right? R plus one equals to um, E of T N R. What does it mean? Well, first of all, in this R part type two round graph, obviously there's no, this is K R plus one three, right? If you have R plus one vertices, by pigeonhole, two of them must lie in the same side because there's only R parts. But this is an independent set. There's no edge inside. So obviously, this is a lower bound on this quantity because we define it to be the maximum size. And Turan is saying that this is the best. That's the maximizer for this problem. In fact, uh, and furthermore, Actually, this is strengthening. The uh, second part, it says that Turan's proof that this is the unique maximizer. Furthermore, TNR is the unique extremal graph. Okay. So let's try to prove this theorem, this extension of Mantel's theorem. Before we prove that, uh, let me first tell you how many edges in TNR. So this is a basic fact that the number of edges, so we know what's this extremal number. Well, if R, if N is divisible by R, then this is exactly one minus one over R, um, N squared over two. That's very easy to show if N is divisible by R. But sometimes n is not divisible by r. We have to take different parts, n over n over r floor or ceiling, then you get a little bit smaller. But the, the quantity that gets smaller uh, is, is, is independent of n. So this is bigger than one minus one over r, n squared over minus big O of r. So this is it. Okay. This big O, small O notation, do you all know the big O, small O notation? So if you don't know, maybe this big O notation, small O notation, and um, you should check it. There's also big omega notation small omega notation. Roughly speaking, I'll briefly mention, if some function is small o of another function, that just means as n goes to infinity, the first function is smaller, it goes to zero, okay? And big O means Um, means fn is at most some constant times gn, where this constant c is independent of n, for any n. And big omega, small omega is the other way around. So check it, if you haven't seen this notation before. All right. Um, how do we prove Turan's theorem? First, I will leave it as exercise for you to try to prove that. As again, here, if you look at all the R part type, I didn't write R part type, right? If you look at all the R part type, complete R part type graph, namely 
we take the same construction, but maybe the size is slightly different. This may be not this size. This may be uh, like 2n over 3, n over 100, n over 100, something different size. Again, it's kr plus 1 on 3. So all this complete multipartite with r parts are kr plus 1 on 3. And um, they all provide the lower bound construction. And Turan's theorem is saying that the balanced one has largest size. So first exercise try to prove among all R part type complete graph, the balanced one has the most number of edges. Okay, exercise. Among all complete R part type graphs or M vertices, TNR has the most number of edges. That's the first thing to try to prove. And in now we're gonna prove Turan's theorem assuming this exercise. What does it mean? That means all we need to prove is that if you start with the graph, so what we need to prove is Take any graph G that's M vertices and H3 uh, does not have KR plus one. And if we know that we can find another graph that's R part tight, that has as, at least as many edges as G, then we are done. Right? Let me write it down. So this means if you have a M vertex graph, that's KR plus one free. How can we use this exercise? And if we can find if there exists the R part type graph, R part type means you can partition the vertex into all parts and all the edges going in different parts. Okay. Uh, uh, F such that EF is at least EG, then we prove to run theorem, mm -hmm. right? Does it make sense? Because every such graph is at most the size of some R partite graph. But by the exercise, all the R partite graph, even if you add, make it complete, at all the edges between different parts, the best you can do is T and R. Okay, good. So, how do we prove this? Well, in common rhetorics, when you see some statement you want to prove, try to prove its simpler version first. And that's what we did already. To prove Turan's theorem, which is R equal, the simple in this case is R equal to two. So you forbid triangle, KR plus one is K3. We did it. And the two proofs we did is what? Induction on the number of vertices N. And the second proof is by considering a maximum vertex, maximum degree vertex, and its neighborhood, partition the vertex sets, okay? Now I'm telling you, both of these two ways can be extended to prove Turan's theorem. And I'll leave it as exercise for you to extend them. So exercise. Extend the proofs. One is the induction. And proof two is consider a max degree vertex. Okay. Um, so let's try to prove it in other ways, not using induction or not making use of the maximum degree vertex. What are the other ways? There are several other ways that are equally beautiful. 
So let's look at this is proof one, proof two, right? Let's look at yet another proof, the, the third proof, proof three, using symmetrization. Uh, Do I have time? Yeah. The third way. Uh, a very nice argument of Zikov symmetrization. And that's exactly what we want to do here. Basically, let me roughly say what it does, this argument. We start with a KR plus one free graph. We're going to do some operation to change the graph without decreasing the number of edges and slowly change it into a R part type graph. <clears throat> then we are done by what we said above. Okay. Proof. <clears throat> So um, that's exactly what we're going to do. We Let's fix the arbitrary ordering of the vertices. Let's say V1, V2, da, 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 to Vn. You fix it, arbitrary. Now we're going to do symmetric symmetrization. So you're going to do symmetrization along this direction. For every vertex, you're gonna do it. So how are we gonna do it? Uh, right. So going along this ordering, we symmetrize Pairs. So, uh, how do I say? We do the following, okay? Going along this order, we, we do the following. You take the first vertex in this sequence, you don't do anything to V1. So, look at V2. So, this is V1. Now, look at V2. Let's first ask the question are they adjacent or not? You only do this operation when they are not adjacent, okay? Symmetrize, symmetrize non-adjacent pairs. What does it mean? Suppose I want V1, V2 is not adjacent. How do we symmetrize it? Originally, V1 is adjacent to some vertices and V2 is adjacent to some vertices. Maybe they have some common neighbor here, right? And some neighbor only for V2, some neighbor only for V1, and maybe some vertex outside that's not adjacent to both V1 and V2, okay? Everything is possible. Now, we're gonna, we're gonna make V2 a copy of V1. What I mean is that we're gonna erase all the blue edges, the, or all the edges incident to V2 and add to it make its neighborhood the same as V1, okay? We're gonna change it to to, to like this, V1, V2. V1 originally like this, right? Now, V2, we make it the same as V1, same neighborhood. Very simple operation, okay? If V2, V1 is not an edge, then make V2 a twin or a copy of V1. They look exactly the same to outside. You cannot distinguish them. If they are adjacent, you don't do anything. All right. 
Now, and officially, this is just the first pair, right? Officially, for we go along the ordering, you look at VI for some I, I bigger than uh, one, two, N. You find the smallest index uh, A. A is not good. Let's see. Uh, J, smaller than I, such that VI, VJ is not an edge, right? So going along this sequence, now when you do VI, you look for, it's adjacent to V1, okay, don't do anything. Adjacent to V2, don't do anything. Now, it's not adjacent to V3. You do this operation. operation. You change, Mm, wait a second. Um, actually, I want to change it so that um, I want to change one to another towards the positive side because we don't want to decrease the number of edges, right? So when the degree of one is larger than the other, you change it. Um, uh, but we need to argue that this process stops. So, okay, let me tell you first the idea and let's try to make it rigorous. Let's try to make it rigorous together. The idea is that if you have, the idea everything is here, you have two vertices that are not adjacent, then you look at which neighborhood is larger, okay? If say the black one is larger, then I make the blue one look completely like the black one. In this way, they, Uh, I know how to fix it. But in this way, they um, you only increase the number of edges. You cannot decrease the number of edges, okay? And you remain in the family of KR plus one free graphs. Another thing we need to be careful is we cannot create KR plus one. You jump out of the family, right? Why you cannot create the KR plus <clears throat> one? Simply because if in this new graph, you have a KR plus one, you cannot use both V1 or V2. They are not adjacent. So you can only use one of them. If you use one of them, you have to use some other vertices. That means the original graph already contains KR plus one. That's a contradiction. Okay. And by symmetrizing all paired of vertices in this way, eventually we're going to prove that two vertices are not adjacent. It's an equivalence relation. If two are not adjacent, you can put it into an equivalence class. And the edges can only be between two different equivalence classes, right? And you have a complete multi-part graph. That's the proof. So let's see how I can fix this proof. I should actually, uh, I should mention that consider an M vertex extremal graph. We should start with this, G. Meaning what? Meaning E of G has the maximum size already. We know such graph exists. You take an extremal graph whose size is the maximum possible among all KR plus one free graph. Now I do what I just said. You fix the arbitrary ordering V1 to Vn, go along this ordering to symmetrize. Now these two must be the same size. Because if one is bigger than another, right? Non-adjacent pairs observation. Non-adjacent pair of vertices have the same degree. Because if in this case v one v two, if one is bigger than the other, you symmetrize it one way or another you're going to strictly increase the number of edges, which contradict to the maximality of G. Okay, good. Now we can go along this ordering. Say you look for V1, V2, and now VI, right? VI say, okay, adjacent to V1, yes, don't do anything. Adjacent to V2, yes, don't do anything. Now you find the first guy you are not adjacent to. 
then you, you do this symmetrization. Okay, that means this process ends in n step, right? In n step, and at the end of the step, where lambda adjacency is equivalence class. Do for the smallest i and do symmetrization. Okay, at the end, this process. Ends in n steps, um, and at the end, non adjacency is an equivalence class. It's an equivalence relation. Is this clear? Because if you symmetrize two vertices, then their neighborhood outside is exactly the same, right? Now, if you symmetrize, if there's one vertex not adjacent to this guy, you symmetrize again, then all these three vertices all look the same. They are, they are not adjacent to each other and look the same to outside. They send all the edges outside. So they have the same neighborhood. What does this mean is that non adjacency is the equivalent relation means the graph is a complete multi-partite graph. This implies that at the end we obtained a complete multi-partite graph. Okay? If the multi-partite graph, the number of parts R is at most the number of parts, let's say k, is at most r, right? Because you have r plus one parts, you have a k r plus one. And we know that if you fix k, if you fix k, the maximum number of edges of complete k part i is two round graph. And it's easy to compute this number, and this number is increasing as k increases. Okay, that's the proof. Um, all right, so it's about time. Next time, we, we're gonna mention quickly uh, an application of uh, Turan's theorem, some geometric statements, and, and we're gonna do two more proofs of uh, Turan's theorem. One is here we have this Z-COP symmetrization. We're gonna do the uh, continuous version, some analytic version of symmetrization using linear algebra, okay? And another proof is uh, we're gonna prove things probabilistically. Uh, another proof by due to Carroll and Wei, a very nice proof of Turan's theorem, okay? Any questions?